Philippa Plantagenet. Explain to me. So the, <clears throat> I don't know if that name Plantagenet. Plantagenet, obviously not, because I've, I've just said it wrong, so I've no idea. Right. Well, that, if you follow the line back up to the top, you'll see where that name Lionel takes Plantagenet. us. Lionel Plantagenet. Edward the Third. Hello and welcome to We Read This. My name's Ash and today I'm going to be talking about Edward the Third, another English history play about a Plantagenet king, one that some believe was written by William Shakespeare. We'll get into how iffy that attribution is shortly, but if we can claim it as the Bards, this makes today the first Shakespeare episode I've done in well over a year. Now, since this whole project began as a Shakespeare podcast, I'm very happy to be talking about him again, however legitimately. But regardless of who wrote it, the play Edward III is, in the words of Giorgio Melchiori, the natural prelude to Shakespeare's second historical cycle. Now, just in case anyone's confused about the order of these cycles, Shakespeare wrote his plays about Henry VI and Richard III quite early in his career, and later went on to write a sequence about the three kings that came before him. So when we refer to his second cycle, these are the ones that depict events that came first historically. In movie lingo, we could say that Edward III is a prequel to a prequel. So what kind of prelude or prequel are we dealing with? Well, rather a strange one. Shakespeare's accepted two cycles, or tetralogies, form an epic chronicle of disorder in England. They depict turbulent times for the Plantagenets, whose reigns come off more like periodic throne warming than sustained and assured rule. Three out of five of Shakespeare's kings meet violent ends, and the two that don't still die prematurely. Henry V is the only king to end his play in triumph, but that triumph is made bittersweet by its historical epilogue. Henry was perhaps only months away from being crowned King of France when he dropped dead, probably from dysentery. Edward III has a lot in common with Henry V, and their plays dramatise their respective involvements at opposite ends of the Hundred Years' War. Like his great-grandson after him, Edward achieved famous victories in France and ends his play looking like an English Tamburlaine. If you've listened to our episode on Geoffrey of Monmouth, I think I mentioned the popular idea that had developed by Shakespeare's time that the Plantagenet dynasty was cursed from the start. And you could certainly believe it from Shakespeare's accepted canon of Plantagenet plays, where the rank diseases at large in the foul body of the kingdom are matched by the physical and moral decrepitude of the kingdom's rulers. And that is where Edward III is different. It is not a portrait of disorder, far from it. It is a victorious play, a happy precursor to what John Julius Norwich calls the rot that starts with Richard II. In Edward III, we have a strong, confident king, the antithesis of his father, Edward II. Edward III's position as monarch in the play is never shown to be particularly under threat. What he stands to lose are the spoils of prospective conquest, both romantic and territorial. In addition, Edward's life is never in peril, although momentarily his son, the Black Prince, is thought to have been killed, before emerging healthy and triumphant. And even if the Black Prince were to die in this play, and historically he would indeed predecease his father, Edward was prolific in producing sons and had four more as backup. So not only is his own reign out of danger, but so is his bloodline. So lots of military success and no serious threat to the succession. It doesn't seem very promising in the way of dramatic stakes. Sometimes the play feels as if it was written for a national holiday or jubilee. Its crowing depiction of a series of famous victories seem included for historical record and celebration rather than uh, drama. There was a good reason for this sense of pageantry. A few years before the time of writing, the English had another famous victory. This was the success of Queen Elizabeth's fleet over the Spanish Armada. As I mentioned in my episode on Edward II, the surge of patriotic feeling that followed this event led to a greater interest among the English people in their own history, thus growing their appetites for chronicle plays. Now, prose chronicles were in existence as well. In 1480, William Caxton had printed the Chronicles of England, for example. But for the majority of Elizabethan England, history was being written in the playhouses. Dr. Anne Kagey writes that the contribution made by theatre to this generational project of writing the nation of England into being was unique, for the English history play provided a popular means for Elizabethan audiences to participate in the twin processes of remembering and forgetting. Forgetting, as we will see demonstrated throughout the history plays, is just as important as remembering when it comes to shaping a national identity. 
Now, if Shakespeare did write Edward III, it is the play of his that comes nearest to undiluted propaganda. Edward's naval victory over the French at Slough's serves as an irresistible opportunity to revel in the more recent maritime trouncing of the Spanish. This involves a pretty mad sequence in which a French mariner relates to his king at great length of how completely humiliated they have been at the hands of that proud armado of Edward's ships. You might have noticed throughout Shakespeare that there are messengers who pop up here and there and take a little bit too much pleasure in delivering serious or gruesome news. There is the sergeant at the start of Macbeth who, despite or perhaps because he has received some injury, reports on the outcome of battle in lavish detail. There is also Carlyle in Richard II who delivers bad news with such agonising carefulness you wonder if he isn't getting some kind of sick kick out of it. You also begin to wonder if small roles like these could be read as commentaries on the kind of actors who might be given to making the most of them. But anyway, the mariner in Edward III outdoes the lot. Who knows what the French king's face is supposed to be doing as this subject of his waxes on and on about the glorious bright aspect of their enemy and the bloody carnage they have reduced their fellow Frenchmen to. It's incredibly silly nationalism but contains some of the most luxuriant poetry in the play as well as an anachronistic morsel of interest for the historian. Here, the mariner describes the formation of the English fleet, which is, in fact, how Elizabeth's ships lined up against the Armada. The fleet, a grove of withered pines, figuring the horned circle of the moon. In Edward II, we saw a king beset with problems from all sides. His son inherited these, not only his issues with the French, but animosity Uh, from the Scots, and the nationalist feel of this play extends to some colourfully anti-Scottish material too. In fact, Edward III may be the play behind a complaint reported to William Cecil by his English agent in Edinburgh, George Nicholson. He writes from Scotland, warning his master, It is regretted to me, in quiet sort, that the comedians of London should in their play scorn the king and people of this land, and wished that it may be speedily amended and stayed lest the worst sort getting understanding thereof should stir the king and country to anger thereat. This might also explain, if we are to believe the play is Shakespeare's, why it isn't included in the first folio, because by the time it was published, that Scottish king of 1598 had become king of England as well. All in all, if you shrink the accepted Plantagenet history plays down to a single story, Edward III could play as the wild shriek of trumpets and sword rattling that sets the scene and gets people in their seats. Or at least the second half could. The play is emphatically split in two and reads almost like two short, somewhat connected pieces. It makes sense militaristically as Edward was ever at risk of a war on two fronts, so we might expect to spend one half of the play facing off the Scots and the second facing off the French. That seems to be the plan until Edward gets sidetracked by the vision of the Countess of Salisbury, who despite being married to a friend and Edward being married himself, he attempts to seduce. The Scots that the Countess has been warding off on the border are forgotten, as she instead has to ward off the advances of King Edward. This she manages to do, showing great cunning and moral courage. Edward snaps out of it, and in the second half we see him back in the role of warrior king as he and his son embark on a series of stunning military victories. It is the abruptness of this shift that makes the play feel like two plays, and is perhaps why David Rintoul, an actor who has played Edward III, chose to summarise the play as follows. Fail to thump Scots. Fail to hump Countess of Salisbury. Thump French. Evidence suggests that it's probably uh, only partly written by him at best. Okay, and the rest written by Thomas Kidd. Thomas Kidd uh, is one of the people suggested. So are uh, uh, Michael Drayton, Thomas Nash, Thomas Haywood, Robert Wilson, George Peel, and Christopher Marlowe, who we talked about yeah. on the last episode. So there's very, very little chance it was actually written wholly by Shakespeare. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's suggested that it's Shakespeare and one of them, not Shakespeare at all. Okay. Yeah, it's maybe a bit cheeky to, to call this episode Edward the Third by William Shakespeare, but he's the best best we've we've got really. Calling it calling it a collaboration with any one of those is is, is sticky. Um, but it's it's likely that he wrote only a bit of it. Mm. Interestingly, a guy called Brian Vickers, who's a sort of controversial historian, um, used a computer program to try and track plagiarism 
and work out exactly how much Shakespeare wrote and who That's wrote. not how algorithms work, Brian. <laughs> well, you can look into how this program works. I couldn't really make head or tails of it. But he came to the conclusion that it was Shakespeare and Thomas Kidd. Um, and he actually came up with a bang-on percentage as well. Like, I can't remember what it was. Of course was. he did. Something like 40% Kidd, 60% Shakespeare, or vice versa. I, does, I don't think that's how plays are written. You do 40%, and I'll do 60%. Yeah. Uh, Will, you've only handed in 38%. <laughs> the audience will be crying out for that further 2%, and God knows I won't <laughs> be doing it. <laughs> Let's get stuck into the question of authorship in regard to Edward III. It was first published anonymously in 1596, as was customary at the time. Plays were treated as the property of the stage companies, the names of authors not listed. It wasn't until 1616 that a publisher called William Stansby took the unprecedented action of printing The Works of Benjamin Johnson, taking Johnson's plays as serious literature and placing significance on single authorship. In that same year, Shakespeare died, and seven more would pass before Hemmings and Condell collected the first folio, 36 of Shakespeare's plays attributed to him. And the first damning bit of evidence for those keen on linking Edward III and William Shakespeare is that the play is not in it. It has been suggested that this may have been due to Hemmings and Condell not being able to secure the rights of the play from its original publisher, or also that it would be a dangerous play to print with a Scottish king on the throne. Either way, for over a century, Edward III remained anonymous. Edward Cappell was one of the first to suggest a link between Edward III and Shakespeare, writing in 1761, Something of a proof arises from resemblance between the style of his earlier performances and the work in question, and a more conclusive one yet from consideration of the time it appeared in, in which there was no known writer equal to such a play. This is a sentiment that surfaces often in arguments about whether or not Shakespeare had a hand in plays. Well, it's too good to have been by anyone else. Which, for starters, is deeply unfair on many great writers of the period. It is not the fault of Shakespeare's contemporaries that their careers happened to coincide with his. There are scenes and characters and even whole plays by writers like Johnson, Marlowe, John Fletcher and Thomas Kidd that could feasibly and convincingly claim to be equal to some of Shakespeare's work. There are also scenes and perhaps a whole play or two by Shakespeare that aren't unquestionable masterpieces. And even disregarding the names of the playwrights we do know of, what about the untold number we don't? The customary anonymity of playwrights of the time mean that there are many unattributed, brilliant plays penned by those whose names are lost to us. Of playwrights working at the time of Edward III's first printing, only two received collected editions connected to their own names, Shakespeare and John Lyley which means that famous plays like Tamburlaine, which were published anonymously, were only reunited with their original authors through historical evidence. No such evidence exists connecting Shakespeare to Edward III. Instead, what we have is centuries of distinguished critics hoping and inferring it is so. Richard Farmer in 1767 said, I have no doubt but Henry VI had the same author with Edward III. Victor Hugo, who translated Shakespeare into French, also agreed and said that Edward III was written by the Bard. Eric Sams has such confidence in its authorship that the subtitle of his book on the subject described Edward III as an early play restored to the canon. But with little documentary evidence linking playwrights to plays, scholars have to come up with interesting methods of comparing texts. One such method is by comparing the engrams of two works, an engram being a numeric sequence of words or values in a text. A trigram, for example, is a string of three words used together. Brian Vickers used this method on Edward III and, based on his findings, said that 40% of the play is written by Shakespeare, the rest by Thomas Kidd. I've not really read enough about the studies using engrams to comment with proper understanding, but it seems from a distance to be a pretty shaky method to use on the playwrights of the Elizabethan era. For starters, it has too formal an idea of collaboration. Plays could be written by up to five different authors, and between half and a third of all plays written during Shakespeare's lifetime were written by more than one hand. Furthermore, playwrights like Shakespeare are likely to have been players as well, so they were acting in one another's plays. Given the liberal magpieing of shiny phrases here and there, I find it very likely that a playwright might snaffle off a choice trigram if it caught the light right. Kenneth Muir writes... 
If Shakespeare had no hand in the play, he was at least intimately acquainted with it, more intimately than with any known Elizabethan play. There is also the issue of Shakespeare having the unfair advantage of a much greater canon to work and source his engrams from. Shakespeare leaves a canon of nearly 40 plays, on top of that long poems and an enormous sequence of sonnets. That's an awful lot of trigrams under his name. By contrast, other playwrights who emerge as reasonable candidates for either author or co-author of Edward III don't have comparable canons. Kidd, for example, is dead by 1594, uh, so Shakespeare feasibly could go on using kiddisms for another 18 years and effectively hijack those trigrams for himself. But aside from trigrams and engrams, others have pointed to the incidence of feminine endings on the verse lines in Edward III, which is a Shakespearean hallmark, but again, not unique to him. Most notably, perhaps, there is a single line in the play that recurs in Shakespeare's Sonnet 94. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. If Shakespeare did write Edward III, it raises the interesting possibility of London playhouses either collaborating or competing with each other on another tetralogy of Plantagenet King plays set before the two written by Shakespeare. First, there is the play referred to as Harry of Cornwall about the childhood friend of Edward I. Then Edward I got his own play written by George Peel, followed by, of course, Marlowe's Edward II and this play, Edward III. Chronologically, this would just about add up as Edward III appears in the station's register in 1595, the same year that Shakespeare's next cycle of plays began with Richard II. It seems to have been a popular play, having been performed sundry times, according to the 1596 title page. But there is no theatre company mentioned, so we can't match it to one associated with Shakespeare. All in all, there are too many questions remaining to say with confidence that the play is his as much as we may like to. As Patrick Juola said on the authorship problem, there are too many mediocre solutions and not enough that are both good and principled. So this was Edward III. Unfortunately, he doesn't have a uh, fabulously long name like uh, Edward II. That's a shame. I think it's just something like the reign of Edward III. Um, so it's printed in uh, 1596. Again, it's unsure kind of when the when the performances, the first performances happened. Mm -hmm. Um it's not. It doesn't pick up exactly where Edward II left off. Instead, it um, jumps way into uh, Edward III's reign and deals with his troubles with the Scots and the French. Always troubles. Lots and lots of troubles. So it's a weird play because he he has. There's plenty of drama in Edward III's life, and one of the biggest ones was trying to make sure when he attacked France or he attacked Scotland, the other one didn't choose the moment to um, you know. Sure. Invade themselves. Um, and that sort of dynamic splits the play totally into two. So the first half is about him going to quell a Scottish rebellion, mm. finding the castle that's currently sort of being troubled by Scots, yeah. occupied by the Countess of Salisbury, who Edward III meets and decides to shag. And he, he will do anything to try and basically one of his allies' <laughs> wives. He's married as well. Okay. Um, he embarks on this fairly um, predatory campaign to um, woo her. Okay. This goes on for half of the play. <laughs> and then he decides, ah, oh, that's a bit wrong, actually. Um, I feel ashamed now. And he gives up. After which, he jumps to France and deals with um, them instead. Okay. I have to say, this is one of the probably only Shakespeare plays I haven't actually watched a production of in some form or the other. But in reading it, it does definitely feel like um, go and sort out the Scots, bit of uh, bit of shagging or, or attempted shagging, and then hop off and sort out the French as well. Okay. There isn't the, there isn't the sense that, you know, the French are at the door and we have to go, otherwise we're going to get roasted. After deciding to lay his claim to the French crown, Edward is called to relieve a countess on the Scottish border. The countess is the wife of the Earl of Salisbury, a friend of the king's who we will meet in the second half in France. When we first see the countess, she is holding off the Scots, led by King David, and slighting them for good measure from the ramparts of Roxburgh Castle. The Scots scatter on the arrival of Edward, and the countess is, to her surprise, soon besieged again, this time from the love-struck King Edward. Historically, according to John Julius Norwich, the identity of this lady is not so much a mystery as the result of a chaotic confusion on the part of Foissart, 
and other less trustworthy sources. She is probably based on Alice Montague, whose husband, Edward, was the governor of the Earl of Salisbury's Castle of Wark, and whom the king is known to have tried, unsuccessfully, to seduce. And there are other stories from Edward's reign that may have contributed to his depiction as a seducer. Later in life, as his queen was succumbing to dropsy, Edward took one of her ladies-in-waiting, Alice Perez, as a mistress. Perez was rumoured for several years to be the de facto ruler of England, as Edward descended into grief and senility in the years after his queen Philippa's death. It would be interesting to know how an Elizabethan audience would respond to the events of this first half. Nowadays, we are very familiar with the ways in which powerful men abuse their position in sexually predatory ways, and a modern audience wouldn't fail to see this on display in Edward III, Here we have the King of England advancing on the Countess, saying, Thy opposition is beyond our law. It is the most dramatically interesting section of the play. Edward is transformed, like Proteus in The Two Gentlemen of Verona, from a hero to a sinisterly possessive character. The Countess is abandoned. Even her father agrees with King Edward when the King demands he instruct the Countess to yield to him. With only her wits, she parries Edward's advances until finally threatening to kill herself rather than submit to him. Only then does Edward come to his senses, briefly admit to being ashamed of himself, and then head off to his French wars. Edward's assault on the Countess is seen in militaristic terms. The phrase of Lodwick, the King's secretary, is a lingering English siege of peevish love. It's worth noting that at the time, cities were depicted allegorically as women. So it is perhaps not surprising that the Countess threatens suicide. The law of chivalric romance is do or die. The supposedly honourable knight-errant, if he happens to fall in love with a bit of road damsel, is usually obliged to have her, die in her service, or destroy himself. This is in keeping with the Renaissance ideal of warring love. Romeo and Juliet shared similar sentiments, and Edward seems to acknowledge the lingering death wish behind his affections by comparing the Countess and himself to the doomed lovers Hero and Leander. A certain romantic cynicism is shown in Edward calling in Lodwick, his secretary, to compose his love letters for him. Even though he comes to dismiss Lodwick's efforts and decide that love cannot sound well but in lovers' tongues, the way in which he was prepared to brainstorm his advances smacks rather coldly of military tactics before the charge. Later in the battle scenes, the play seems to confirm that heaven aids the right. There is much talk of whose side God is on, and how prophecies are to be interpreted. While Edward seems to be granted every success and be proven right in every prediction he makes, his rival King John is shown to reliably misconstrue prophecies. The question arises then, in his assault on the Countess, is Edward reaching the limits of his divine right, or is he being tactically outthought? The Countess defends her virtue, not to mention her husband's honour, as if it were her land as if to highlight the parallel between the type of war on show in a woman's defence of her virtue and real war, Edward's wife, Queen Philippa, is later seen pregnant on the battlefield. Women warriors were not unheard of between the 12th and 14th centuries, and Queen Philippa may well have been one of them herself. There are references in the work of the chronicler Froissart to Queen Philippa leading an army as a young and comely princess, the mother of heroes. And in a sense, the Countess corrals King Edward onto his military victories in France, giving him moral instruction as she does so, perhaps ensuring that he stays on the side of the right, and therefore on the side of heaven. So that's the play side of things. We've done it in a different order to the last one. But on the history side of things, this was a king who was coronated at 14. His his children, as I mentioned in the um, Marlowe episode, included the Black Prince and John of Gaunt. John of Gaunt will be a major character in the next play we talk about Richard II mm-hmm. as a kind of older man. Um, and he was generally thought to be a very good king. He, he was a strong contrast, uh, opposite to Edward II, who was flamboyant and mm-hmm. uh, had all of his uh, favourites that people didn't like. And instead, Edward III was strong, upped the country's morale, was successful in lots of wars, and then um, ended up in a bit of a panic towards the end of his reign because his his succession was um, fudged by the bloody Black Prince, who looks like the perfect next king, dying of dysentery. That's so so many of them go like that, be it cholera, <laughs> be it shitting themselves to death. There's a lot of shitting themselves to death. I mean, Henry V went the same way, dysentery. Yeah. 
Whether or not Edward III should indeed be restored to the canon, he casts a very long shadow over Shakespeare's accepted history plays. The first tetralogy climaxes with the Wars of the Roses, in which different members of the Plantagenet clan fought for the right to rule. These are, of course, the family members in the famous Houses of York and Lancaster, and Edward III was progenitor of them all. He was remembered as a strong king, personally and militarily, a relief for the subjects who could remember the rule of Edward II. According to Peter Ackroyd, he could not have made a stronger contrast with his unfortunate father. He is generally reported to have been convivial and engaging. One of his mottos, woven into his jacket, stated simply, It is as it is. Edward wasted little time in making clear the distinction between him and his father. With the memory of the terrible English defeat at Bannockburn still raw, Edward recaptured Berwick. At the start of the play, we hear those treacherous Scots have broken a truce with the King of England and mounted invasions across the border. But as John Julius Norwich says, Edward had in fact no such league with Scotland. Rather, he had been coerced as an adolescent king into signing the Treaty of Edinburgh-Northampton, which recognised Scotland's independence under Robert the Bruce. The Bruce had his young son, the future King David, married to Edward's sister, Joan. At this point, Edward was still under the control of his mother, Isabella, and her lover, Roger Mortimer. Edward III would capture David in 1346 and only release him as part of the Treaty of Berwick in 1357, in which England and Scotland entered a bitter truce. Scotland forced to pay reparations after Edward and his forces had sacked Edinburgh. By this time, Edward had achieved his famous victories in France and the rise of English fortunes, as well as the humiliation of the Scottish allies across the Channel, contributed to the Scots accepting a ceasefire. Edward's disputes with France began back in the 1320s upon the death of the French king, Charles IV. Charles, known as Charles the Fair, was the last surviving son of Philip the Fair. Charles's brothers, Louis the Quarreller and Philip the Tall, had both died without having sons of their own. And unfair as it might seem, Charles didn't have any either. His death, therefore, led to a succession crisis. One surviving sibling was Isabella, wife of Edward II, mother of Edward III. It was through her that Edward laid claim to the French throne, something that the French rejected on the grounds of the Salic Law, a penal code dating back to the 6th century, which the French fudged up in order to justify barring women from taking the crown. The French were never going to let Edward rule them, and instead they elected Philip of Valois. The entire history of this is laid out at the start of the play in rather heavy-handed exposition that requires Edward to momentarily forget his own family tree. But was my mother sister unto those, he asks? Yes, he is told, but the French obscured your mother's privilege, and though she were the next of blood, proclaimed John of the house of Valois, now their king. The reason was, they say, the realm of France, replete with princes of great parentage, ought not admit a governor to rule, except he be descended of the male. Hot on the heels of establishing his right to the French crown, a French duke arrives at Edward's court, demanding, on behalf of the newly elected King John, homage, or else Edward's French lands will be confiscated. See how occasion laughs me in the face, cries Edward, who declares himself King of France as well as England, and thus begins the Hundred Years' War. Four key English victories taking place over 20 years are compressed into the play's second half. These are in order the nautical victory at Slough's, the 1346 victory at Cressy, the successful and crippling siege of Calais from 1346 to 47, and the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. So much history is here condensed that the author found it necessary to replace King Philip with his son, John II, as by the time he reached the ending at Poitiers, Philip was already dead. Edward invaded in 1339, causing untold damage to the French towns and countryside. The English pillaged, wasted and raped, but made little meaningful tactical progress in the opening stages of the war. France was stronger and wealthier and could afford to wait out Edward's provocative raids, knowing that sooner or later he would be forced to return to England and raise some more money. The first major victory for the English was at the Battle of Slough's in 1340. This effectively ended Philip's hopes of invading England. The English were outnumbered, but they had the Dutch in support, described in the play as those frothy Dutchmen puffed with double beer. After the defeat, the mariner I mentioned earlier recounts to the king that on the top gallant of the admiral and likewise all the handmaids of his train, the arms of England and of France unite are quartered equally by herald's art. How dare he crop the fleur de lys, asks King John. 
The fleur de lis, the heraldic fringe symbol, was adopted by Edward into his coat of arms. Laying emphasis on his matrilineal claim to the French throne, he placed the fleur de lis on the upper left quarter of his coat of arms. This quarter, or dexter chief, is usually reserved for the paternal coat of arms, and his adoption of Isabella's was seen as quite outrageous. Nevertheless, there it remained on the royal coat of arms until 1801. Slough's was a massacre. The French ships were packed tightly enough to resemble a forest of masts. John Julius Norwich writes that The fish in the harbour drank so much French blood, it was said afterwards that had God given them the power of speech, they would have spoken in French. Our favourite mariner eagerly confirms the full-scale destruction of his friends and peers. Purple the sea, whose channel filled as fast with streaming gore, that from the maimed fell, as did her gushing moisture break into the cranny cleftures of the through-shot planks. Here flew a head, dissevered from the trunk. Their mangled arms and legs were tossed aloft, as when a whirlwind takes the summer dust and scatters it in middle of the air. Next comes the Battle of Cressy in 1346. Foreshadowing Agincourt nearly 70 years later, the English victory was due in large part to the success of English longbowmen, who could pick off the French charges as they struggled up muddy hills. Edward took no prisoners, and the wounded were dispatched with a misery cord, or mercy killer. This was a long, thin knife, so designed to be poked through the gaps in a knight's armour. The king was similarly ruthless with his own. During the battle, his son, the Black Prince, came under such a heavy attack that a messenger was sent to the king for reinforcements. King Edward responded, Let the boy win his spurs, for if God has so ordained it, I wish the day to be his, and the honour to go to him and to those in whose charge I have placed him. The play presents the same moment with the following. The prince, my lord, the prince! Oh, succour him! He's close encompassed with a world of odds. Then will he win a world of honour too, if he by valour can redeem him thence, if not what remedy? We have more sons than one to comfort our declining age. Edward's reliance on fate being on their side is also made clear in this passage. This is the day, ordained by destiny to season his courage with those grievous thoughts, that if he breaketh out, Nestor's years on earth will make him savour still of this exploit. The Black Prince, of course, survived, but one notable casualty of the battle was the King of Bohemia, known as Blind John of Luxembourg. Despite being blind, King John had insisted on being led into battle, so he could score at least one blow with his sword. His obliging entourage doomed themselves by fastening their horses to their kings, and together they marched into battle like a weird spider horse. All of them died, and they were found the day after the battle in a messy tangle of horse and rope. The Black Prince took King John's emblem of three ostrich feathers, as well as his motto, Ich dien, I serve, as his own, and to this day it is still held by the Prince of Wales. Cressy was another messy massacre for the French. The reasons usually given for the English victory include the superiority of their longbowmen, who outranged their opponents and had a lethally fast rate of fire. Also noted is the calamitous cavalry charges of the French, who ended up advancing haphazardly and uphill under heavy archery fire and through thick mud. Many died being trampled or suffocating in the pile-up of bodies. Norwich reports that the chronicler of the Abbey of Saint-Denis suggests another reason for the French defeat. The common soldiers wore tight shirts, so short that they exposed their private parts every time they bent over. The noblemen, on the other hand, wore hauberks extravagantly decorated and surmounted by vainglorious feathery crests. The Lord God, offended by so much obscenity and vanity, decided to use the King of England as his flail to beat the French host into the ground. Next we have the siege at Calais. Edward's forces effectively starved the city for a year. When emaciated citizens attempted to leave the city limits and were driven by desperation towards the enemy, the English stopped them, forcing them to die on the outskirts rather than escape. According to Peter Ackroyd, the commander of the French garrison wrote to Philip VI that we can find no more food in the town unless we eat men's flesh. This is the last letter that you will receive from me, for the town will be lost and all of us that are within it. The letter was intercepted before it reached the French king and was delivered to Edward. He read it, applied his personal seal, and sent it on to its destination. Edward's forces resided in a makeshift village the king had named villeneuve le hardy It's worth remembering that Edward's court still spoke, for the most part, in French, which is why a young court poet called Geoffrey Chaucer 
wrote his first verses in French. The village took on a life of its own, according to Foissart, acquiring haberdashers and butcher's shops, stalls selling cloth and bread and other necessities. Meanwhile, Calais starved. It took a year before a surrender was offered, but Edward refused to accept it unless they submitted to a final humiliation. Six principal citizens, he demanded, must appear before him, barefoot and bareheaded, with halters around their necks and the keys of the city in their hands. If they did so, he would dispose of them as he pleased, and the rest of the city would be spared. When six citizens thus presented themselves, Edward ordered their execution. It took the intervention of his pregnant wife, Queen Philippa, begging Edward on her knees to save the six men's lives. This is how she appeals to him in the play. Ah, be more mild to these yielding men. It is a glorious thing to establish peace, and kings approach the nearest unto God by giving life and safety unto men. As thou intendest to be king of France, so let her people live to call thee king. For what the sword cuts down or fire hath spoiled is held in reputation none of ours. On the 4th of August 1347, Edward III entered Calais in triumph, evicting its starved citizens who were left without homes and without belongings. According to Peter Ackroyd, the descendants of those colonists were to remain there for over two centuries until on the 7th of January 1558, Calais was recaptured at last. After the English took Calais, there was nine years of skirmishes and fighting off the Black Death. But in the play, we leap this decade directly after the pardoning of the six citizens to an account of the Battle of Poitiers. Here we have yet another massacre at the hands of the Black Prince and his longbowmen, resulting in the capture of John II. The French outnumbered the English, but despite their crushing defeat under the arrows of longbowmen years before at Cressy, they had neglected to train up any of their own. This is the last battle described in the play, and though Edward and Philippa are on stage to hear it, they were not actually in France at that point. Instead, the Black Prince was running raids, having set up his court at Bordeaux, where his son Richard was born. Richard of Bordeaux, as he was called, later to be crowned King Richard II. The new French king, Charles V, lived up to his own nickname of Charles the Wise. He turned out to be a shrewd tactician and gradually began countering the Black Prince's raids and restoring his kingdom. The Black Prince himself suffered from dysentery, dropsy, and became enormously fat. Eventually, Calais and Gascony were all that Edward had to show for his glorious campaigns. He died senile a year after the Black Prince, leaving the crown to his young grandson, Richard. It was a long reign, but the play ends in glory in September 1356, before Edward's slow and miserable decline. Richard II, the next history play we shall look at, begins 42 years later, in April 1398. Well, I think if I've, if I've got my centuries correct, we're getting on for the first Scottish king of England. Uh, no, that's a, that's a way off yet. You mean James? Yeah, is James, is James not soon? James is um, after Elizabeth, so we're still in the Plantagenets at this point. Okay. Um, we're, we're, I mean, we're about... So, so James comes in towards the end of Shakespeare's life, which is oh. uh, early 1600s. I'm sorry, I, I meant publication-wise. When oh, sorry, publication-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Printed 56. Yeah, very close. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah. Scottish, Scottish English stuff would be very on the minds of the people who were watching the play. Well, um, it's interesting you say that because this play is absolutely stuffed full of anti-Scottish feeling and jokes. In mm. fact, since it's a bit of a tradition to recite anti-Scottish dogma on this podcast, I wrote down some of Shakespeare's <laughs> yeah, or possibly that's about Shakespeare's. If if we were if we ran an algorithm to detect how much what percentage of this podcast was anti-Scottish dog roll, it would yeah. probably be about forty percent. It's a genuine eerie read this episode. It's full of anti-Scottish feeling. Um, I think this is the Countess of Salisbury um, fending off uh, Edward, who says at one point, what a grief it is to be the scornful captive of a Scot, either to be wooed with broad, untuned oaths or forced by rough, <laughs> insulting barbarism. Thou dost not tell him, if he here prevail, how much he they will deride us in the north and in their wild, uncivil, skipping gigs. Bray forth their conquest and our overthrow, even in the barren, bleak and fruitless air. <laughs> Fucking hell. All right. Save a bit for later. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it, I mean, it happens throughout. It's a real onslaught on the poor old Scots. Um, presume, and it is weird as well. Like it, really, it, does, it does stand out. Presumably it's because of the family antagonism with the Scots. All of these three Edwards had come up against... All of these three, I mean, um, Edward III, Edward II, and 
Edward the First, who we haven't talked about play about, but um, yeah, they've all come up against the Scots in one way or another. I'm trying to remember who came who came after who bloody came after Robert. Was it David? Yes, King David. Yeah, it's King David. David the Bruce. King David that um, this Edward is fighting. Mm-hmm. Okay, King David the Bruce, the sort of Houndland version of Robert the Bruce, didn't do a lot. I don't think the Bruceling. I think you know he was kind of like a tribute band. <laughs> it's a lot. To be fair, it's a hell of a pair, of, big pair of shoes to fill. Yeah, hell of an act to follow. <laughs> As mentioned in our episode on the alliterative Mort Arthur, Edward III had something of an obsession with King Arthur and oversaw banquets and dances where attendants dressed as figures from Arthurian romance and even recreated a round table in 1344. Keen listeners may have noticed that the alliterative Mort Arthur and Edward III share a similar beginning, with Arthur and Edward both discussing their right to European territory, being insulted by a European visitor and thereby encouraged into conquest. The prophecy of Arthur's return was a popular one, and as early as 1330, Edward was being described as Arthur reincarnated. He intended to form a new and ambitious Order of the Round Table with 300 knights, but instead started the Order of the Garter, a brotherhood of just 26 knights, including commanders of the famous Battle of Cressy. The origins of the Order of the Garter are subject to debate, but one tradition holds that a certain Countess of Salisbury was attending a ball when her garter fell off. To hush the laughing spectators, the king snatched up the garment and returned it to the countess, saying, shame on him who thinks ill of it. A phrase which subsequently became the order's motto. They both sound un- unusual. They're not the blueprint of the classical history play. Well, Edward II at least is... Um, Edward II is it's very dramatic and streamlined and, it, and yeah. focused. It feels like a play. Um fans of uh, Derek Jarman, there is a film uh, by him. I don't know if you like Derek Jarman. Um, um, not someone I've come into so much contact with, really. Uh, it's. I find the, the film a bit hard work. It's a bit sort of ponderous and feels a bit like actors rolling around in a dressing up box for two hours. That is my general um, experience of period pieces. Well, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's not really a period. It's very minimalist. Um, it's... Uh, using the story to talk about the gay rights movement. Um, Ed, Ed, Edward II sounds like, I don't want to say a more worthy play, but certainly a more interesting play in terms of its themes. I would agree, yes. Um, Edward III is weird. Ed, Edward III really does just seem like a lot of fucking about. But it sets us up, up nicely for um, the history plays to come. Can't wait. And that's about all we have time for. Thank you very much for listening to Eerie This. We'll be back soon with some more history plays and King Arthur. Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by leaving us a nice review on iTunes, uh, following us on all the socials, or even checking out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Until next time, happy reading. Happy <laughs> reading.